my guests are here. Remember, these are your questions that I'm answering. So I'll answer any questions that you want to ask me. And of course, they should be questions that help everybody. So, you know, a question like, oh, I have this piece. And does this signature look like this signature, Dr. Lark? That doesn't help everybody. That only, you know, I want to help you too, but that only helps you. So in this environment, I want you to start typing right into those comment sections, right into the chat. Ask your questions about art, antiques, collectibles, whatever it might be. Um, if you want to ask me personal questions, I'll answer those too. Um, and remember the newsletter. Sign up for the newsletter. What am I going to show you in the newsletter? <laughs> An amazing thrift shop find. You're not even going to believe it uh, in the newsletter, which is coming up. You sign up at drlaurieV.com. It is free. It is under the free tab, that thumbs up right there when you go to your smartphone and go to the menu. And then you'll see, of course, all the different tabs freeze right there. Sign up for the newsletter. You can just put in your email address and we will send it to you when it's ready. Again, there is no charge for you to get the newsletter. So people have been asking that. So I hope it's helpful. The newsletter really is one of the best things that we do. I don't know. We do a lot of good things here, <laughs> but that's a good one. That's a good one. So we hope that you'll sign up for the newsletter. Um, and then a lot of you are asking me what I did. You're asking on social media, and I, I promise you I will go through uh, what happened with my recent accident. And it actually has a vintage twist, too. <laughs> so right up our alley, actually. So yeah. Yeah, yeah. Terry had a, a video call appointment. We had a lot of fun. I was doing video calls today and found some great things. Oh, my gosh. Some real bargains, too, out of those video calls. But also, the video calls are easy to book if you want to book them. Um, it's a good way to get all the stuff done, you know, take a video call, get multiple items, or if you only have a few things, you can do it that way too. Where are those questions? Thanks for being with me. I'm Dr. Lori, the PhD antiques appraiser, all different answers to your questions. And I'll use my years of experience and of course my education to answer those questions. So, uh, hi, Alex. I have a receipt from 1796 bought by a great grandfather of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Hey, cool. For silver salt spoons, the, the spoons were made by Voorhees. Do you have the actual spoons or do you just have the receipt? Do you have the receipt with the spoons or you just have the, you just have the receipt and you're connecting it to Franklin Delano Roosevelt? Let's talk about it both ways, right? So if you have the receipt and you have the provenance to Franklin Delano Roosevelt and you also have the spoons, you know, that's the jackpot. That's the king's ransom. That's all of it. That's what you want. If you only have the receipt, and you can connect, of course, Franklin Delano Roosevelt to that receipt and maybe to your family, maybe, then it's even better. So that's what you're looking for. Anytime that you can keep any kind of, of early receipt together, that would be great. Um, so basically, the Roosevelts have a very long standing tradition. And of course, even one of the places that's near and dear to my heart, many of you found me through the curse of Oak Island, but Oak Island, Nova Scotia. Roosevelt also was one of the treasure hunters there in his younger days. So um, in fact, but you're relating it to his great grandfather and this particular receipt. If you have the silver salt spoons, do you know what salt spoons are all about? They basically will have little individual uh, serving pieces for salt, just for salt next to a dish in the 18th century or the 1700s. And a little spoon would sit in it and you would actually salt your own food from this little serving dish that was right next to your place setting. So a lot of people don't realize that salt was actually um, was actually served that way. You actually served it yourself. Salt was, of course, a big deal, still a big deal in a lot of ways. Um, and that's basically what we're looking for. So if you have the spoons, if you have also the receipt, and you can connect provenance yourself to that particular family, then you really have a winner. Good question. That helps everybody. <laughs> I have a question about good costume jewelry. I've noticed that cheap costume jewelry has a bad metallic smell, okay, when you wear it. Will good costume jewelry smell uh, with smell this way with particular necklaces? I'm binge watching videos. Um, you will learn a lot and you'll also, of course, with the binge link, it'll be a little bit more convenient for you. A lot of people prefer our binge link because you can watch in order, right? You can just keep watching and watching, not worry about you know finding something. So a couple of different things. What you're smelling is, of course, yes, the metal. And even good metals, for example, sterling silver has a particular and distinctive smell. So a distinct smell of sterling is something that you might want to recognize. So find a piece of sterling silver and give it a good whiff <laughs> and smell it. And when you recognize that smell and try to sort of familiarize yourself with those types of things. 
Now, when you say cheaper costume jewelry, a lot of the pieces that were made after 1995 or so tend to have lower quality metals, in fact, and some of them you really should be careful if you're wearing them at all. So you have to be aware of that as well, because some of them, of course, could contain toxins. So you want to be careful. Um, but yes, there are distinctive smells. Sometimes it's not even, even you can kind of smell it in your jewelry boxes. Um, you can certain, certain areas of your jewelry box might actually emit or off gas a particular smell. So yes, what you are identifying is great. And you're like, it's great, but it's a bad smell. Well, it's great because you're starting to notice certain attributes or characteristics about your costume jewelry collection. And that's going to help you to become uh, a person who is able to identify quality, which is what I try to teach you all the time. So you understand it can identify quality. Good question. Is it a good time to buy bicentennial memorabilia for resale in a few years? Yes. I've been telling you that. Yes, it's absolutely a good time, Tammy, because in 2026, you're going to see, of course, another anniversary of the founding of our country or our independence, if you will, in the United States, um, going looking back at 1776. So you're going to see, of course, that anniversary and oftentimes colonial revival pieces and anything that has to do with, of course, the celebration of um, either the centennial, the bicentennial, um, or, of course, the 2026 will have more value in 2026 because it's reaching another pinnacle, another uh, particular and important date. So that's what's important as well. So, yes, I would say, of course, you should definitely take a look at bicentennial pieces and sort of hoard them now if you can or buy them now because they're going to be cheaper now. And in 2025 tw into 2026, then they're going to jump. You're going to see them because people are going to go, oh, no, it's 2025. I've got to get all my, you know, bicentennial stuff together, right? And then people are going to start thinking about those prices, the way they want to list and price those pieces. But yes, as I've told you before, and you're good to note it, um, it's a good time now to start buying the bicentennial memorabilia for resale. Yep, yep. And resell it, you know, starting 2026 or so. Uh, does false crafts Amalfi pieces have significant value? Okay, so false craft in general, if you don't know about false craft, false craft is a um, relatively well-known characteristic name for ovenware, cookware, and other types of, of course, kitchenware, ceramics. Um, Amalfi pieces particularly relate to, of course, the style and, and sort of forms of uh, the Amalfi Coast of Italy. Amalfi pieces are also marked. You can clearly understand their patterns. So, um, so yes, I would say false craft pieces actually have significant value in general. And then you have to drill down to which patterns are more valuable. So if you're thinking about false craft, you want to think about their patterns. You want to think about their which individual forms you're looking for, right? Size will ma make a difference with respect to value as well when it comes to false craft. And I always try to talk to you in lists so you get the list. So you're like, okay, Dr. Lori said false craft. You know, so a lot of you tell me that you're taking notes. So false craft, you know, I'm gonna look for size. I'm gonna look for condition. I'm gonna look for individual patterns. I'm gonna look for the glaze because the color of the glazes are very important with false craft. I'm gonna look for the marks and how they differ. You know, if something says, you know, it's oven proof, if something on false craft says, you know, um, uh, you know, this is for decoration only, that kind of thing, then you're able to help identify the date too. So hope that helps. Hope that helps. Good questions. We've got a lot of things to cover, a lot of ground to cover, of course, as usual. We cover a lot of ground in my classes too, and we have uh, classes coming up. Uh, we're selling them out one after the other. So thank you very much for that. They're $39 for um, a two-hour class with me and others who like art, antiques, and collectibles with values and appraisals. Um, at the time of this particular taping, taping that is in fact uh, the chart, the fee at the time of the taping. So we try to keep it as cheaply as possible. Um, we have a special time because you guys asked for a special time, so we did that too. So you know, we listen to you. We want you to, of course, join us and be with me. And I love to, I love to teach the classes. So it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. All right. Uh, any general info on bride's baskets, desirability, some glass and some glass with silver. If you don't know what a bride's basket is. Bride's baskets were very popular in the early years of, well, the late 19th into the early years of the 20th century. And they, in fact, are oftentimes made of glass. They're usually set in front of a bride and groom at the wedding or at any of the parties leading up to the wedding. And typically what would happen is they would 
put people would come up and want to talk to the bride and groom and they would literally put money into this basket or this bride's basket. It's usually made of glass. Sometimes it will have a silver plated base that's footed with sort of a basket handle also in silver plate and a glass insert. Very, very typical. They were very popular for a long time. I want to say between 2015 and 2020. Um, they have not really fallen out of favor, but we don't see as many of them on the market. People who love Victoriana or the grand millennial style, often, you know, that style that's so popular with, you know, the 30 somethings, if you will. Um, they, a lot of people are collecting those. So they are desirable still. I think the ones that are in fact glass with the insert with those silver plated inserts are more desirable than just the pure glass ones. Some people get them confused with those 1960s topped candy dishes. You know, it looks like an urn, it's got a stem and it's got a base, and then it looks like an urn, it's got a top. Some people think those are bride's baskets. Those are typically 1960s um, candy dishes with a cover on them. Uh, but bride's baskets, pretty typical. Uh, when, when are they most, when do they come out most? Usually like May, June, uh, months that are popular for weddings. And a month that's also becoming very popular for weddings are the fall. Uh, toward the end of the year, the of course October, November. So we're seeing not all the not all the wedding stuff is happening only in May and June anymore. It's happening also October, November. So there you go. Yeah, yeah, there you go. See, so there was a bride basket that was handed down. Oftentimes, bride brides baskets do stay in the family, which also speaks to the fact that some of these things don't come onto the market all that often. So that's important because, you know, if there's something from your mother's wedding, it's relatively difficult for you to or grandmother's wedding for you to actually do that. I have a whole cabinet of blue willow plates, uh, candle holders and more, not really clay, but wonder if the collection is worth something. So a couple of different things. Blue willow, many of you will recognize that term, blue willow. Blue willow, in fact, is, um, is comes, many, many different manufacturers make blue willow or basically will call their patterns blue willow. So this becomes relatively important and it will be made throughout multiple centuries. Oh my gosh, Dr. Larry, really? Yes. So it's made in the United States, it's made in, in England, it's made in other parts of Europe, it's made in, you know, you name it. It's made in a lot of places. It's very popular, it's very pretty, it's a classic look. So wonder if the collection is worth something? I need to know what you have in your collection. Do you have a service for eight? Do you have a service for 12? Do you have, you know, um, small trink do you have small trinket dishes that go with it? Do you have cups? Do you have saucers? Do you have, a you know, this kind of deal? So yes, I would say that typically Blue Willow still sells well. However, some of the more inexpensive makers who are mimicking or copying Blue Willow made by the high-end makers, you know, you're going to see, of course, those are not going to be as valuable as others. But when you're looking for Blue Willow in general, look at the mark, make sure the marks match because you may have a uh, a, a set that was started in the 19, early 1900s and then uh, mom added to grandma's set after she passed in the 1960s and now you've got different manufacturers or different marks on those sets. So Blue Willow, what are you looking for? You're looking for consistency of pattern. Make sure the patterns are consistent. You're looking for deep colors, right? Deep colors for Blue Willow. You're looking also for, of course, the individual marks and where they're made. Try to match match when it comes to the marks. That's going to be important too. And the larger the set, every time you add to an existing collection, you add a little bit of money and value too. Good question. Good question. So, and of course, I'm fielding your questions. I'll tell you what's what. Um, and so you can learn just about how to resell, how to collect for yourself, what's quality, how to identify it and such. <laughs> I like Tootsie Rolls. <laughs> Thank you very much, John. Thank you very much. It's nice to see you. I appreciate that. And a big hug back to you too. I love the hug sign. Don't you love the hug, hug emoji? I think it's so cute. Oh God, that's funny. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm trying to teach you all what you can look for. And so many of you have been nice enough to write to me or send in a, you know, or, or put a comment on Facebook or put it on Insta or, or write something and basically say, Hey, Dr. Lurie, I learned this. This was great. I was so happy because I really am getting this. I'm watching from Parkersburg, West Virginia. I have a green vase that's 10 inches tall. It's funny looking hole in the bottom. There's a stamp inside at the bottom with a big A. See now, this is the kind of question that, you know, kind of doesn't really help that much, right? It gives you a little bit of information, but only about this specific bowl, right? So do you think your, your particular piece, um, the funny looking hole, I'd have to see this particular object because I don't know how you describe a funny looking hole, right? 
So if you will send a picture, it's easy to do. Where do you send it? You can send a photo to me and I will review it. Any of in, any and all of you can to drlaurieV.com. And you can actually do that right on my website. And there are three buttons on my, on my homepage, three buttons. They're right there. Boom, boom, boom. And they look like this. One's a camera, one's a phone, and one is actually photographs. So basically hit send a photo and I will look at that image and I will tell you, and usually I ask for three images. I'll look at those three images. You fill out the form and then I'll get back to you and I'll tell you, oh, this is what you should do with this. Or, oh, this isn't really worth you spending too much time on. It's not worth the cost of an appraisal. So I will let you know what you actually have. And then of course you can decide which fee structure works for you. But you have an opportunity to have me, my brown eyes, look at this, right? And I hope the brain works too with my brown eyes. Have me look at this particular picture and go from there. So uh, easy to do. And you, of course, can do that. I had an Eisenberg fur brooch on Thursday's live. It's set sterling with faux pearls and glass meath. It's missed some stones repair and value. Okay. Did I see it, Melanie? I, I'm guessing that that I didn't see it. So basically, what your, you know, your question is for the value. If it's missing some crystals, that's going to impact value. But the fact that it is Eisenberg. Now, for those of you who don't know what the heck we're talking about, this is, in fact, a fur brooch. So on fur coats and fur stoles, oftentimes a big, a pretty good sized brooch would be actually worn. So a couple of different things. Um, when, of course, you know, real fur was was a little bit more fashionable than maybe it might be today. Eisenberg is a relatively well-known and very popular, it's a, it's a costume jewelry uh, maker. And I have put Eisenberg on my list of some of the best costume jewelry makers and manufacturers to look for. So if it's sterling silver and it's marked sterling silver, it's going to have some value for its sterling content. Faux pearls, often and glass beads put together, often have, of course, a nice stylistic look. And Eisenberg is basically known for these large rhinestone kinds of pieces. Now you're saying it's missing some crystals. So if it's missing some crystals, then you in fact would probably want to investigate repairing it before you resell it. Now, I can't give you a value without seeing how many crystals are missing. Are there crystals missing or are they glass? Because there's a difference between crystals and glass, right? And in any Eisenberg piece, I want you to look for size. I want you to look for, of course, the individual traits of the individual material. So if that's crystals, if that's glass, if that's pearls, if that's a composite, if that's, you know, and also the metals are going to be important, right? You also want to look for the Eisenberg marks because there are many different Eisenberg marks. And I've talked about those also, not only here on the channel, here on videos, but also on the website under research. You can even just go to our search feature on drlaurieb.com. You can just put in Eisenberg and all the Eisenberg stuff is going to come up. The search is right there with the magnifying glass above the, blue, the red contact Dr. Lori button. So these are some of the things you want to look for because you want to make sure you know the difference between having a piece of Eisenberg that has the Eisenberg name or Eisenberg ice, or if you have the name that says just an E or whatever it might be, because that's going to help you also identify date and quality of the particular pieces. So yeah, I'll take a look. Sure. No problem. Um, I will say that if it's missing a lot of crystals, there are a lot of fine people out there who in fact do repair these pieces. Anytime you're asking for restoration or repair of any art antique or collectible, ask for a before and after photographs to see what kind of work they do. So you can make an assessment before you start spending money on restoration or conservation. Now you know a little bit about what to look for when it comes to, of course, Eisenberg. So specific uh, costume jewelry designer. So I'm taking your questions. There's so much to talk about. Let's see. Is Churchill and Johnson Brothers good blue willow? Okay. So Tracy wants to know specific ones. Johnson Brothers is a very well-known blue mill, mill, makes blue willow and has for a long time. Now, when you say good, is it high quality in the manufacture? Is it worth a lot in the value? Those are some of the questions. So Johnson Brothers are very well known and they've been doing this for a long time. Pardon me. When you're looking for any types of pieces, I want you to always, especially when it comes to China, China is very, very popular now. And a lot of people, of course, are collecting China. The blue and white China, which is, of course, Blue Willow and what it's known for. I'm going to move this girl before I knock her over. <laughs> I'm going to knock her over. <laughs> um, a couple of different things when you're looking at any kind of China, you want to make sure that you do have good quality pieces. And I want you to look for things like very, very small cracks. I want you to look for flea bites, little tiny 
itsy bitsy chips. I want you to be careful and I want you to look for um, elements that of course will show you that, well, wait a minute, this design kind of looks like it's the same, but there's something off about that particular flower. So you really have to investigate when you are looking at these pieces. And one of the things that many of you will forget to do is this. You are in a thrift store, you're in an antique mall, you're wherever you are and you're looking at a teapot and you see a, a blue willow teapot, for example, and you look at the top and it looks like it's right and you buy it and then all of a sudden you get home and it's really too loose. It doesn't really fit or it's really too tight. You can't get it off uh, out of the actual teapot. So make sure you check the lid and make sure you really look at a saucer and a teacup. A lot of times they'll look similar but the actual pattern will be different. It'll be close, but not the same. You want to really look and make sure it's the same. Use your loop to do it. That's why the loop is a money magnet. It's gonna teach you a lot. Who can I trust to tell me if I have real amber in a crudely strung necklace? I think mom got it on a trip to Russia. I have no idea who you could trust, Carol. I don't know. I have three degrees in the field, 25 years of experience, major museums. I've been to Russia four times you know, looking at amber and evaluating pieces and talking at the Hermitage Museum. I don't know who you could trust, Carol. No idea. Come on, Carol. Come on. <laughs> who would you ask? Ask me. <laughs> hey, yeah, yeah. I would go on stage. I'd be on stage at all these events for years, for years. I'd talk for, I, I mean, I remember I did a seven hour marathon once we were raising money for a particular charity. Seven hours I stood up there doing appraisals alone, you know, not teamwork with everybody else, alone, appraisal, seven hours. Somebody actually came up and went, who do I go to for an appraisal? Who do you go to for an appraisal? I mean, seriously? <laughs> anyway, well, it's nice to see you, Carol. You can ask me. I can certainly evaluate the crudely strung necklace of possible amber. <laughs> when you're looking at amber, I gave you a video on what you should look for. So maybe you should look for the binge link, Carol, <laughs> in addition to me. So, yeah. Amber is, is a little bit tricky because there's a lot of plastic out there. There's a lot of amber that, of course, is fake. And in fact, it's, it's, very, it's a little bit tricky. So I help you do that too. Um, I got a really pretty fur purse, really pretty, made in Italy. Can feel the quality. Can it have much value? Yes, it can. It can. Um, purses in general are very, very popular. People like accessories. They like to, of course, collect accessories. Um, are Italian purses better than French purses, better than Belgian purses, better than American purses? It depends on the purse. So it's not like one purse is so much better than another purse kind of thing. Um, but basically, yes, it can. It depends on what it looks like and it depends on the values. Now, you know, some purses have tremendous value, even if you look at contemporary purses. You know, so you're looking at, you know, a Louis Vuitton or a Birkin bag or whatever it might be in the contemporary world. And you're going, oh, my God, they really have a lot of value. They really get big numbers for these pieces. Right. Um, versus pieces from that are in the vintage world. But even vintage purses from all over can be very valuable if they're stylish and if they're in have good quality. So you want to look for a couple of things when it comes to purses. First of all, the clasp has to open. The actual open element has to open and close easily. That's one. People are like, really? You know, if it's a zipper, it's got to work. So that's another thing you want to look for. You want to look for hand beadwork if you can, or anything that shows that it is handcrafted, right? So here are your list. Hand beadwork or hand craftsmanship, whether that's embroidery, whether that's needlework, petty point, beadwork, whatever that might be. You want to make sure that the actual support materials like that opening will actually, usually that's metal, that, that, that is actually, of course, um, that, and thank you for the super chats and super stickers. Somebody recognized, of course, to help support us doing all of this. So basically, um, remember that you want to look at that particular idea. You also want to look for size. That doesn't mean they all have to be big. You know, the small ones can be valuable too. Those small little clutches can be valuable. Look for designer names, right? Designer names. Look for some of the big department stores, the Bonwit Tellers, for example. You want to look for those high-end pieces if you're looking for the mid-20th century, Lord and Taylor pieces, for example. You want to look for, of course, designer names as well. Um, maybe you want to look for a... Um, whatever it might be, but many, many people like vintage purses and many people will pay a lot for vintage purses. So don't poo poo it. Now, remember fur and other particular types of um, uh, designed materials are going to, of course, have more or less value depending on how they are presented. So don't forget that too. What's the best way to determine if a handmade quilt is old? I have one with what appears to be bloodstains. Okay, 
So I've talked a little bit about blood stains and I've talked a lot about quilts. The way you're going to determine if a handmade quilt is old, right, is basically by the textiles that are used. So a couple of things. So you're looking for the quilt. First of all, you wanna look for size. Second of all, you wanna find my video on quilts because there are a couple of videos that I've done on quilts, more than a couple. I want you to also look for, of course, how big are the blocks, right? Because oftentimes there are these square blocks and then there's just a repeating pattern. Sometimes it might be flowers and they might be a repeating pattern. So how big is that? That's gonna indicate age. Oftentimes the bigger ones are usually more, more young, are usually younger and the smaller ones are usually older. But again, um, crazy quilts usually are older. Crazy quilts have all different types of materials that are being used. And a lot of what a crazy quilt is showing you that other quilts are not is actually something called the, this, the fancy embroidery work, which is also known as turkey work. So that's another thing you wanna look for when it comes to quilt. And their age will also be based on, of course, the types of textiles and the types of threads. Oftentimes applique pieces, right? Not the patchwork ones, but applique quilts could be older. So there's a lot in there. Um, blood stains. Blood stains are usually from horses. Oftentimes quilts were utilized in horse-drawn carriages, um, but blood stains, in fact, can also be, I've seen and appraised some quilts that were in battles. And those particular quilts oftentimes had blood stains because uh, during a particular period, uh, certain soldiers would actually bring quilts as their bedding, uh, as they, of course, went off to uh, fight whatever uh, battle they might be fighting. So there's that. But there's a lot of things that you want to look for with respect to it. And also the, the measurement of quality has to do with how many stitches, of course, to an inch. Check out those videos. There's a lot of information there, too. Yeah. Okay, I guess I need a video call. <laughs> I can help you, Carol, you're a sweetheart. I can help you, it's no problem. Um, it won't be difficult for me to help you out there, so. Hi, Don, brownie video camera, eight millimeter, is that valuable? Okay, first of all, it's a Kodak brownie. If it's a Kodak brownie, eight millimeter, then we've got a couple of things happening. In terms of value, I always say, it all depends on what's valuable to you, right? And I use my friend, Oprah Winfrey, as an example. You walk into Oprah's house, you know, $10,000, probably not that valuable to her, right? That doesn't mean that your camera's worth $10,000. But, you know, it depends on who you're talking to. So value, of course, is relative. It's kind of like age. It's relative. If you're looking for a brownie camera, an 8 millimeter, or any of these antique or vintage cameras, here's what you're looking for. That one would be vintage at 8 millimeters. But basically what you would be looking for is you're going to look for the brand name. Is it an Agfa? Is it a Kodak? Is it a, you know, there's a million of them. So is it a Leica, that kind of thing. Find out what kind of camera, so who made it is important. What it does is important. Oh, I don't know what it does, it's some kind of movie camera. You gotta find out what it does. Is it a 60 millimeter, is it an eight millimeter? Just like what you said. So there's that. Does it work, right? And how difficult is it for you to get film to make it work? There are a lot of people out there who are hobbyists who love the hunt for some of these particular elements like flash bulbs on you know, more contemporary cameras of the 20th century, that kind of thing. So that's what you wanna look for as well. And uh, of course, when you're looking at an eight millimeter, value on it depending on condition will also be important. So in terms of it, your eight millimeter, you're probably in that 35 to $150 range, but I have to see it because again, you know, I'm going to have certain things. Like I might look at it and go, oh, you're missing this part. And you're like, no, no, it looks like it works. Eh, you're missing this part. So that happens a lot with um, camera pieces and photography outfits in general. So good question, though. Don always has a good question or five. <laughs> so that's good. That's good. So we're, we're taking your questions. I'm happy to answer them. Let's see what we've got from all over. Thank you for being with me. And Later, of course, I'm going to identify and tell you a little bit more about, you know, my recent mishap. <laughs> I'll tell you a little bit more about that, too. Um, oh, thank you very much, Patricia. And hopefully you folks are signing up for the newsletter and hopefully you are subscribing to the channel. So, you know, yes, sharing it and liking it are important. I, you know, and I think a lot of times you guys sort of get involved in, of course, the, the, the listening, which is great. You know, maybe you forget those little things. What equates to better craftsmanship when looking at the back of a brooch? Hi, Fern. Here's what equates to better back cat craftsmanship when looking at the back of the brooch. I have spoken about this ad nauseum. I have talked about the back of brooches specifically for a long time. But here are the things. I'll give you a list. So first of all, it's the pin back, the actual little pin that attaches the brooch to a piece of clothing. That's one. 
the clasp or the way in which that particular pin sticks into another element and allows it not to fall off your, your clothing. That's two. The third thing that you want to look for is you want to look for weight, right? So is it weighty? And if it's weighty, it has to be balanced where the pin goes. Sometimes they'll put a pin back right at the top and a very heavy piece and the whole thing just basically falls over, you know, or it has to be in the middle. So that has to be something that the, in, that the manufacturer or the custom jewelry designer has thought about. So that's another thing that I want you to remember. Um, the other thing about what you look for is you can look for the little wells or you can look for whether or not the pieces are set with, of course, a, um, whether they're set with, of course, the, um, the opening at the back so it can allow light to come through. Oftentimes with good Austrian crystals, for example, or Swarovski, for example, they allow the light to come through. Um, what else should you look at from the back? So if it's all one piece or if it's actually small little stamped out pieces of metal and then the actual objects like on those cluster earrings, those plastic cluster earrings, usually it's stamped metal and then they just sort of sew the earrings or the beads onto that piece of metal. So oftentimes those are lower quality pieces. I hope that list helps. Lots of questions, lots of people, lots of fun. <laughs> Good to be with all of you. The other situation when it comes to um, these particular ideas is remember when you're looking at these objects, I want you to identify the quality of it, which is why I show you so many images, which is why I talk about so many pieces. And this is why with the Dr. Lori Lives or with any of the videos, I'm giving you a lot of different objects because you don't walk into one of these thrift stores or into a yard sale or into an estate sale and there's only one kind of object. You know, in our homes, we don't collect only one kind of object. We have all different kinds of stuff. That's why I have the diversity. And of course, the expertise helps me to help you with respect to the, getting the diversity out there because we don't only have one type of object. So that's why when you're watching my videos, you're going, yeah, Dr. Lori's talking about something different now. It's because you guys are probably going to encounter different types of things. Any suggestions for resources to identify signatures on artwork? Yeah, um, here are the resources to identify signatures on artwork. First of all, you have to know the individual styles, right? So you have to be able to look at a work of art and say, oh, okay. And I've talked to you many, many times about how you can actually um, identify a name that's difficult or scribbled on, or you can't read it. I've taught you those things over the, over the time with other videos. But when you're looking at resources to identify artwork, you need to know, am I looking at a piece based on the style that's from 2005 or is from 1905? So you need to be able to learn those stylistic characteristics, right? And one of the ways to start that is you look at these pieces and you say to yourself, okay, in the 19th century, we saw more landscapes, for example. In the late 18th century, we saw more portraits. In the 20th century, we saw more abstract, abstract pieces. In the late 20th century, we saw, saw more non-objective pieces, pieces without any object, mostly colors and forms, right? So once you can sort of give yourself these sort of like a timeline of art history, it's a lot easier than start zeroing in. But if you're only trying to go by, here's the artist's name, and that's all I want to do, you're really not going to be able to easily learn and stick it in your head how to identify quality artwork. So try to do the, what type of art is it? And when was that particular style popular? Then you can narrow down to signatures and identifying signatures in terms of your resources. Because remember, there are a lot of artists out there. There are artists who have made it, right? Artists who are, you know, high-end, well-known, gallery-represented, museum-collected artists. And then there are artists who are doing it because they love it, doing it because it's fun. They're not trying to make their life work out of being an artist. And they sign their names on their artwork too. So let's get the foundation, the basics down, and then you can start, start to narrow down what you have with respect to, of course, the signatures. But on my videos, I have taught you guys how to actually see the videos, how to actually identify the artwork. So check those out. The anniversary of JFK death is coming up. Uh, should, have been, should we be looking for memorabilia to sell in a couple of years? I'll tell you, uh, presidential collectibles particularly, presidential collectibles in general will always sell well. There's always somebody looking for a president's collectibles. Kennedy happens to be one of the most popular when it comes to the collectibles market. So sure, yes, when there is an anniversary coming up, the, the market tends to spike. A big anniversary tends to spike that market. So that's important. 
But in fact, when you see this, he's not the only, of course, um, he's not the only most popular of the presidents. During a presidential election year, 2024, for example, during a, a presidential election year, you are going to see all the president's memorabilia and all political memorabilia in general go up a little bit. So sure, you can start to collect that now. And that's a good idea in sort of, it sort of dovetails off the, should I be collecting bicentennial, centennial, or of course, independence type of pieces like, you know, George Washington's wallet, which I appraise for a television show. And a lot of you are telling me that you're watching a lot of my television shows, which of course is fun too. So yeah, good question. I bring my lip with, with me everything I've got over peaceful looking at me weird. So bringing your loop with you is very smart. And I would get over those people because you know what those people are doing? They're thinking, what's she looking through? I think I need a loop. That's what they're thinking. <laughs> so yeah, you really need to bring your loop with you because this loop will actually tell you. And of course you can go on my specials and shop page and buy the recommended loop that I recommend. I do get compensation when you do that. But for the most part, it's easy to find. It's on the specials and shop page at drlaurieb.com. Scroll down, hit go shopping now. And then you can see all of the different things that I recommend, whether it's for storage or display or loops or whatever. But the loop is important and it's important because it's going to help you to see the minute details. The kids love it because the kids take the loop and they just start looking at everything. They're looking at the brother, they're looking at you know everything around them. But that's, the loop really will help you. I'm glad you take it everywhere because you know you will find that. I don't think you should be ashamed to pull it out and show and show everybody you're using it, you know? Some people don't do that. Excuse me. Some people don't do that. My lipstick is falling off. <laughs> Some people don't do that because, in fact, they um, uh, they think that, you know, they're looking too closely and they want to sort of get the piece and get it out of there quickly kind of thing. So it depends on when you want to use the loop. But I would say having it on hand will probably help you. I have approached with the patent number on the back, leaf design, and the metal has divots to look like diamonds. There's nothing there with faux pearl. Okay, Don, you have a brooch. It has patent numbers on the back. That could be for the design patent, right? It's a leaf design and the metal has divots to look like diamonds. Oh, the metal actually has divots to look like diamonds. Okay, there's nothing there and it has a faux pearl. All right, here's a couple of things about it. First of all, patent numbers can be looked up. You can look up and see the date for the patent number. The other thing that you could be looking at is you could be looking at the patent number, for example, the pin, when they actually made the actual pin so a lot of times the hardware, which is what that's called, can be what you're actually looking at in that particular case. So um, that's actually what you're seeing in that manner. So be careful what you're looking up because you might think you're looking up the design of the actual brooch when you're looking up the design for the pin or for the, the, the clip-on earrings or whatever it might be, whatever it might be. So if you want to send me a picture, I certainly will take a look and I appreciate the super chat and super stickers too. So when you're looking at brooches in general, I want you to look for those particular characteristics. Look for bright colored, right, nice glass. If you have the Presidium gemstone tester, you wanna look, you wanna look at that. And a big kiss to you. You know, you wanna make sure. I'm glad this is informative and fun. So basically I want you to look for uh, you know, precious metals that you might have on a brooches and such. So anyway, so that's what we're looking at. Is it normal for German silver jewelry? We're only doing jewelry. You people have nothing other than jewelry. I mean, come on. <laughs> German silver jewelry to be unmarked. Um, I have seen many pieces of German jewelry that just says Germany, right? Is there any way to tell if it's a real German silver besides guessing? Okay, we're not guessing here. No, there's not guessing going on. There, I give you a lot of different ways that you can actually test these pieces. There's, there's actually metal testers on, our, on my website too that I recommend. Um, the other thing that you want to do is you will be able to, as you look at more and more pieces of any kind of jewelry or a piece of art or an antique or a piece of glass, the more you look, you educate your eyeballs and you will learn more about all of it. So that's basically what we're looking at. That's, that's pretty important. Notice that she tends to answer questions that are of value to lots of folks, not just something looking for a specific value. Or yeah, PL, that is what I do. I ask that. I do that purposefully because I want you all to learn. That doesn't mean that I won't answer individual questions, but I have a whole thing set up for me to answer your individual set, uh, questions on drlaurieb.com. You know, I want to drill down for you and understand these other questions for you too. But in this environment, because I'm doing a show here, you know, I want everybody to watch and I want you to rewatch and I want you to share it with people who would learn from this and it would help them. 
you know, that's basically why I asked for these questions to be that. So, yeah, and that's why I also tell you this stuff in lists. I make it easy, trying to make it easy for you. Did you say that we should try to sell Princess Diana stuff this year or next year? Um, uh, you are best. Okay, I appreciate it. Um, a couple things. I have said that this summer, 2022, will be the anniversary, the 25th anniversary of the death of Princess Diana. I have said that because these are typically like John F. Kennedy's anniversary of his death, right, that we just talked about before. Um, this becomes an important time. So if you have uh, things from the Franklin Mint that are Princess Diana, right, dolls, maybe uh, trinket boxes with her image on it. Maybe you have a collectible plate from her 1981 um, wedding. Maybe you have, of course, a beanie baby, a princess beanie baby that raised money for the Princess Diana Memorial Fund. This would be the good time because on August 31st of 2022, that's going to mark the 25th anniversary year, of course, of her death. And as, of course, uh, culture has it, we see, of course, a lot of press and a lot of information about that particular person around two weeks before up to her act the actual anniversary of the death. We see that with many, many famous people. So you want to be aware of that. And yes, that would be a good idea. And I base this information and I base all of this advice on years of expertise working in museums and understanding how these markets work. You know, knowing what the markets typically do. It's called patterns of collecting. And it's something that, you know, I've been trained to do. So that's why I like to share this information with you so you can succeed. And while I'm sharing information, I'm going to share how I did this. <laughs> this. Some of you said, that's a bad finger to hurt, Dr. Lori. I will tell you, many of you have been asking. And actually, some of you on Facebook even were, um, we were playing a game of how many stitches did I get? So some of you want to know that. I will tell you that I told you that it has a vintage bent. I did... Um, my television, uh, I did my television hits, they're called in the TV world. So I did my television appearances um, uh, earlier this week, and I do them, you know, one after the other as, as I can. And basically, I was, I was helping out in the studio, and I lifted up a punch bowl. Happened to be this punch bowl that's right here. And basically what happened as I lifted up this punch bowl, which I've lifted up in this studio many, many, many times, the whole piece actually broke and it broke in my hand. I will pick this up like this carefully so I don't end up in the emergency room anymore. <laughs> in my hand. <laughs> and I ripped open this finger pretty good. <laughs> I did a pretty good job on it, let me tell you. And there was a whole lot of blood and I will confess this to you, it was a rite of passage for me because I've never had stitches. So, and, you know, the studio guys got me to the emergency room. It was a little bit of, ah, you know, um, here at the studio. And they got me to, the to of course, the emergency room. And the doctors and the nurses and everybody was super great. Um, you know, the med techs, everybody was wonderful and lovely to me. And uh, it was extremely, extremely an, a harrowing situation. I had, I really was very surprised. Why did it happen? Uh, could have been a crack that you couldn't see, could have been a temperature and humidity change, right? And the piece just decided that it didn't like me lifting it up. Now, I always lift everything up from the bottom. I don't lift from the top because I've been trained not to. But in fact, this one bit me, if you will. And for those of you who are curious, and I want to thank you all, you know, I had my class that night and the folks in my class were so sweet and so wonderful and really made me feel good because I really had quite a nerve wracking day. But in fact, um, I guess it's fine. I don't know. I don't know how to assess whether or not it's fine. I can assess quality, but I don't know whether or not this is fine. I guess it's healing. This feels all right. Um, but I will tell you that many of you guessed the number of stitches. Do you want to guess if you didn't guess yet? And then I'll reveal it quickly. Want to guess some stitches? How many stitches do you think you have? If this is what happened to the actual piece, I don't know if you can see it, but it is a big and sharp and jagged, jagged piece. If you can see it that way. I'll turn it one more time for you so you can see it. It's really not good. And vintage, the piece dates to the 1950s and it's an American punch bowl. It does have matching cups. Uh, the cups were not near it at the time. You can also see the crack here. So of course, it's going to uh, probably be retired, if you will. So we don't hurt ourselves anymore. If you're guessing the number, you want to know the numbers? Okay, you ready? Eight. Eight stitches. They're in there. <laughs> 
they're dark, they're black, they're kind of scary. Um, I was a little taken aback, but I was so impressed with, of course, how calm everybody made me. I will tell you this, my blood pressure went through the roof, but it came down very quickly. And what was funny was when the doctor said to me, wow, your blood pressure just really dropped like a rock. So I was grateful for that. <laughs> And I'm grateful to all of you. Thank you for your concern. Thank you for your questions. Thanks for being with me. I'm Dr. Lori, PhD Antiques Appraiser. I'll see you next time.